let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. I am basically preaching two messages in one because I'm trying to do something I've never done before. Yes, I'm going to preach the gospel every time I get an opportunity as I preach about Jesus. But I am focusing also on what is the gospel as a a preface, if you will, to the message. And so, <clears throat> by the grace of God, I am preaching in your hearing, if the Lord will so lead me. Jesus reveals God's true intent behind the law. Part 41, the law of retribution. Just Jesus' evangelistic campaign. Day 289, since January the 20th. <clears throat> I don't know if that's exactly correct, but that's what they tell me. Cut that on. Since January the 20th, 2017, this year. Day 656, since January the 1st, 2016. The preface is, what is the gospel? God led me to do this because so many people are confused about the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, the gospel is embodied in these words. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. <coughs> By which also ye are saved. <coughs> Pardon me. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Tomorrow I'm going to share uh, some special commentary on this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2 which says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him Crucified, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, for He died for our sins. Oftentimes, ladies and gentlemen, and you may be seated uh, in the Bible, the prophet of God was used by God not only to preach and proclaim the truth, but to be a symbol and uh, oftentimes the prophet is seen, uh, is sent rather to be a symbol to other preachers and to other people uh, to provoke confession of sin and repentance and getting back to the main thing. Everybody has their calling. And uh, what I'm doing today, preaching the gospel every day, is not only beneficial to lost people who need to hear the gospel all across the world, all across the nation and around the world, but it is symbolic that all of us as preachers 
and Christians ought to, ought to be proclaiming the gospel in some way, shape, form, or fashion each and every day of our lives. What is also symbolic in what I'm sharing with you today from that passage is I'm reminding preachers that instead of getting caught up in politics, instead of getting caught up in societal issues other than as it relates to the gospel, we need to do as Paul, who was a very educated man, to say, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. One day in the near future, by the grace of God, I will preach an entire message on this passage. But it is very fitting uh, that Paul said this. Because Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus Christ is everything. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is the beginning of everything for you and for me. Beloved, dealing with the previous verse, R.C. Sproul said, the gospel is called the good news because it addresses the most serious problem. that you and I have as human beings. Uh, be very careful over here. Remember what happened yesterday. Okay, and in the back, uh, he's having a problem with this. If he got something else that he can use, let him use that. Uh, yeah. You just, you, just you, you take control over it yourself. Just pull it out of there. And you just take control over and put it over here. Give him some advice on that. The devil is busy trying to hinder the word of God from going out. Just go ahead and give it to him. If you're on camera number three, uh, we have five cameras going out of here, streaming around the world. If you're on camera number three, which is a Facebook camera, uh, uh, the devil has attacked that one. And so uh, one of our technicians is trying to resolve that issue. And so you can go to camera one now, or camera two, or camera four, or camera five, especially one, two, and four. We have two on Facebook, two on Periscope, and one on Gospelite House of Prayer and Gospelite Society. So continue to pray as the devil is uh, trying to hinder the word of God from going forth. But be that as it may, we will continue. Ladies and gentlemen, R.C. Sproul said, The gospel is called the good news because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have as human beings. And that problem is simply this. God is holy and he is just and we are not a man somebody. That is the problem. And at the end of my life, I'm going to stand before a just and holy God 
who made me, and I'll be judged. And I'll be judged either on the basis of my own righteousness or lack of it or the righteousness of another, Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus lived a life of perfect righteousness, of perfect obedience to God, not for his own well-being, but for his people, the people he died for. He has done for me what I couldn't possibly do for myself. Can somebody say amen? You might as well humble yourself and embrace that. But not only has he lived that life of perfect obedience, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice in my place to satisfy the justice and the righteousness of God for me and for you. That is the gospel. Believe the gospel, dear friend, today and be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day and he'll save your soul. Just, just hold that one. Just hold that one up and uh, let the other one just stay down. Just hold up with your hand. Uh, Okay, uh, but you need to you need to get that one going. Is there is there a problem? The one you put down, you need to get that one going. You got that under control? Okay. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try to do something I have not done for several weeks, as God has stopped me right there at that passage. And so I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, as we continue with the life of Christ as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 38 Of Matthew chapter 5, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus says unto us, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also and if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat let him have thy cloak also and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile go with him twain and as i said to you last week only god only christ only the holy spirit of god can help you do that Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Don't fear them not paying you back. Just go ahead on and do it. What many Christians have decided to do when people ask them for a loan or for some money, they have been burnt so many times they just say, no, it's not a loan. I'm giving it to you. And uh, when somebody comes to you in need, you just pass it on. Uh, basically, they're saying, I know that I'll never see that money again. And it happens most with family members. And this coming Thanksgiving, you're going to have some family members not come at all to the family dinner because they owe family members money. You're going to have some come to the, be bold enough to come to the family dinner, 
sitting right across the table from a family member they owe $500 to and won't say anything about it and try to avoid our contact and so forth and so on. Francis Bacon, you may be seated, said in taking revenge, a man is but even with his enemy, but in passing it over, he is superior. Jesus' interpretation of the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth law, goes contrary to our sinful nature, doesn't it? I'm reminded of a story that was in the newspaper around the world today. And I told you that people will get upset about their food, particularly gluttons. They are very serious about their little G-God food. I was taken aback when in this story, and of course now in newspapers all around the world, you can see the video. When I saw a poor white woman be beaten down to the ground by a skinny black woman, but was strangely hitting this white woman with a fierce left hook that I have not seen since Sugar Ray Leonard. Surely this woman should be in the boxing ring. I, I, I've never seen a left hook like this woman's left hook. Now I, I and I, 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 I may get somebody mad here, but uh, she, she was hitting so fiercely, this white woman. She gave her two black eyes. I've never seen anything like it. And I looked at the picture closer afterwards and the woman looked like a man. But yet she was with this other man like she was his girlfriend. She was skinny and he was rotund, I mean obese. And she was throwing that fierce left hook and he acted like he was trying to calm her down because the white woman who evidently owns a restaurant served the black people cold fried chicken. I told you don't get in between a glutton in their food. And this rotund individual, who I'm sure the chicken was for, mostly, he acted like he was trying to calm his girlfriend or wife down or whatever the case might be. And I assure you, I assure you, I don't want to meet him. Because, come to find out, he had a fierce right hook. The daughter's, the, the, the woman's the daughter jumped out of the car after seeing her mother pummeled with this black woman with this fierce Sugar Ray Leonard left hook that came out of nowhere. This teenage daughter, bless her heart, tried to get out to defend her mother. And she raised up like she was going to hit the black woman, but backed up and backed away. She pulled her right little hand back, but somehow the rotund big black man We finally saw his rage over 
getting some cold fried chicken. And he threw one punch and knocked the little girl out. Now, you talk about eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This was some serious retribution for nothing but some cold fried chicken. Not like they didn't give you the chicken, but the chicken was cold. And there are many reasons why it could have been cold. And how many of us have had some cold fried chicken? And how many of us know that sometimes some of the best tasting fried chicken is cold? Or not fresh right off the stove? Because it's marinated and been sitting for a while. Sometimes we just need to chill out. Amen, somebody. However, once we are saved, my beloved, we have the power of the Holy Spirit to resist not evil or an evil person who attacks us on account of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now make sure that when you cry persecution, that is because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not because of your evil, your sin, or your failure to provide some hot fried chicken for your customers. But Jesus commands us to go even further. Not only does he tell us to not resist evil or the evil person or the harm that others intend to do to us, but he tells us to extend our charity to those who do us harm at the point of injury. One preacher wrote a book titled Let It Go. How many Christians need to let something go before it gets out of hand? This ought to be for many people a let it go Thanksgiving. Isn't it amazing? No matter what kind of family you're born and raised in, thank God for those rare families uh, where it's see, the, the kids rise up and say, oh man, my dad and my mother loved me and, and we just had a a wonderful family. It's, it's not true altogether, but you know, you, we, we, we marvel. I marveled when George W. Bush would always talk about how much his father uh, loved him and cared for him, and he was such a great man. That's well and dandy. Uh, but we didn't know he was grabbing butts and maybe female butts and behinds not only sitting in the wheelchair but a story came out this week where he did it as president and harassing sexually harassing people and I'm sure that that kind of stuff rubs off the apple does not fall f far from the tree so with all of the warm statements about our parents we all have issues and issues in the family, uh, be they white and wealthy like the Bushes, or black and down and out. We all have issues in our families. And, uh, and so therefore, we all ought to just commit. Daniel White the fourth in the back we all ought to commit to a let it go Thanksgiving. How about that? Just let it go. Ill feelings, negative feelings, still hurt thinking that one sister was favored over another sister, 
civil rivalry. Uh, one child trying to get the praise of the father or the mother or both over the other one and the father and uh, loves his children all the same and he praises one for one thing she did. He praises another uh, for something else she did and then uh, there's some kind of competition thing going on. Everybody wants to be the star of the family. Everybody wants to be the one who is noticed. And that's not how it ought to be. We ought to be humble. And we ought to practice on this Thanksgiving week. Instead of staying home curled up in a fetal position under a little huggy bear blanket by ourselves eating some messed over Thanksgiving food we bought from a restaurant because we're too stinking proud to go home and uh, for whatever reason with the remote control in our hands in the black and dark night binging on some show that you can hardly stand Daniel White the fourth Let this be a let it go thanksgiving. Can somebody say amen? Let it go, let it go, let it go. And go home. Now there are some who don't need to go home because it's that bad. But if you have a reasonable situation at the homestead. Suck it up. Let it go. Forgive the person who said something negative to you. And uh, let them forgive you for your bad attitude, your bad spirit. Hang these words on the wall based upon T.D. Jakes' book. I have not read the book. But the title is good. Let it go. Get a banner created at Kinko's or some print shop. And run it across the wall in front of the Thanksgiving table and uh, have it to say, let it go. Just let it go. Ill feelings towards your mother, how mean she was, let it go. Ill feelings towards your brother because he was uh, such a sorry, uh, no account individual because he didn't help pull his weight, let it go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. The sister who forsook you after you helped her so much and left you by yourself, you're going to have to forgive that and let it go. The sister who did not communicate with you clearly and uh, did not speak up and say things that she should have said, let it go. And eat a great meal, have a forgiving heart, and a heart that is, by the grace of God, somewhat forgetful. And if you cannot forgive somebody, if you cannot let it go, stay home. Don't go there and be a bump on the log, sitting over in the corner trying to find you some alcohol to drown your pain. Because especially if it's a black family, they're going to look at you funny. I don't know what the white folks do, but they're just as crazy as some black folk. 
in the family. We all have our issues. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Do you know there's going to be some fights at some Thanksgiving dinners this week? In fact, I, I hate to tell you this, but somebody's going to get killed right after Thanksgiving dinner. They don't want to ruin the Thanksgiving dinner because, you know, mama can put her foot in it and uh, man and, and really cook something. They're going to eat that and enjoy that and then they're going to kill somebody. Now you watch what I tell you. It's going to be in the newspapers. I'm not trying to predict anything. I hope to God that does not happen, but I'm just telling you it happens every year. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible background commentary says the blow on the right cheek was the most grievous insult in the ancient Near East. It was an insult and an act of calculated contempt. And it was never taken lightly. Kent Hughes writes, according to rabbinic law, to hit someone with the back of the hand was twice as insulting as hitting him with the flat of the hand. It was an insult for which a Jew could seek legal action and satisfaction. It's called in legal terms assault. That is, he could seek damages. The back of the hand meant withering disdain. It meant that you were scorned as inconsequential, a nothing or a nobody. Or a wicked person, a foolish acting person, a rebellious person. A stubborn person, an evil person. Imagine how you would respond. I don't know how you would respond. I think I know how most people would respond. I know how I would respond. But we do know how Jesus would respond. Not only because he told us so, but he did it. Matthew 26, 67 says, Then they, his accusers, spat in his face. That might be worse than the slap. I thank God I've never had anybody to spit in my face. I think it would drive me crazy. I think I would want to retaliate on somebody's head uh, if they spit in my face. I think that's worse than the slap. They spat in his face. You talk about insult. You talk about disrespect. And there are places still in the world today where, where people will do their little goggle and spit in somebody's face. That's the ultimate insult to me. I am reminded that I went into an Italian restaurant one day in a town known to be rather racist. And uh, and uh, I went in, you know, kind of half kidding as the young people at the uh, ta uh, at the counter, and I said, "Is it okay for me to come here? Is everything all right?" Uh, and uh, and then, then the old man stormed out, and uh, I said, "What is going on?" And he went out and spit on the ground. I said, "Whoa, what, what?" 
And I asked a young person, you know, young people are more reasonable than the old racist people. And I said, is everything all right? He said, yeah, everything, he'll, he'll be all right. And so I was concerned about the food that they were supposed to make me. Uh, I was hoping that he would not go around the back and spit in my food. Uh, that's another insult. Then they, his accusers, talking about Jesus' accusers, spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him. Jesus practiced, in the words of Barry White, what he preached, as predicted in Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to my to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I did not, or rather I hid not my face from shame and spitting. My God, my God, what a savior. He did that for you and for me. Our reaction to offenses and insults is not about being powerless or weak. And again, make sure you're doing it for righteousness sake uh, when you want to wax eloquent about how you took something and not for your evil, wicked sin's sake. Uh, that's the judgment of God on you. But Jesus told those who arrested him that they did not need to waste their time coming against him with spears and clubs and chains. He could call down 12 legions of angels to defend him. But he willingly, you talk about uh, a security force, 12 legions of angels. You talk about a secret service. <laughs> my soul but he willingly submitted to their offenses and insults because it was all a part of God's larger plan and as the older preacher said he didn't say a mumbling word now if you uh, submit to the insults and the slap on the face and you're mumbling and grumbling and cussing under your breath and you mad as hell and you might as well hit back because you're doing it verbally and you mumbling and grumbling and cursing under your breath at the people and calling them everything but a child of God then uh, that what you're doing it does not count and it does not resemble what Jesus did can somebody say man he said not a mumbling word he just took it faith in christ is never a guarantee that our lives will be easy in fact we've said repeatedly this morning through much tribulation must we enter into the kingdom of god and that is true for everybody don't let the prosperity gospel people fool you they're catching hell too and oftentimes more hell and when they fall they fall big when we are attacked by others if we realize that too is a part of god's plan for us we can turn the other cheek only by the power of the holy spirit how about it christian friend are you doing that when they come after, after you on the job. And they may not slap you on your cheek. They may not uh, spit in your face. Thank God. But they may, they, they may slap you with a false accusation that will cause you or could cause you to lose your job. And by the way, all of you folk who have jobs, do your job right, be on time, 
do what you know you should do because once they really find out that you are an all-out Christian, they're coming after you and they will take away your livelihood. They will give you hell on the job and please do not uh, like uh, one pastor, one old pastor said, don't give them a stick to beat you with. Amen, somebody. Now, if you are with us today, my beloved, and you do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to meet him today, and I want you to trust him as your Savior today. For those of you who are Christians, make sure you suffer for righteousness sake, not for your lies, not for your tardiness, uh, not for your rebelliousness, not for your meanness. Uh, don't touch that wall back there. Not for your disobedience, uh, not for your bad attitude. Some of you so-called Christians have a bad, stinking attitude, and you're going to lose your job because of your attitude. And you might be the best worker there. But the boss cannot stand your attitude, and if the boss cannot stand your attitude, you've got to go. Especially if you live in Texas, and if you live in Texas, you can get fired for nothing. You can get fired for the look on your face, and you can't do in the words of my dad's friend, nushin about it, okay? So uh, you make sure you suffer for Jesus' sake and not for your evil's sake. And with that said, back to those who don't know Jesus as Savior. If you want to be saved from hell today, first accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Secondly, accept the fact that there is a penalty, there is a punishment for sin. Always. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We die physically because of sin. We die spiritually because of sin and go to that awful place called hell. Third, accept the fact that you're on the road to hell right now. Yes, you are. If you have never trusted Christ as Savior, you've never believed in Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is an awful and sad place. A place without God, a place without Jesus, a place without mercy, a place without light, a place with much pain. You don't want to go there. And here's how you can avoid going to hell. That is the reason why Jesus Christ came. Let's get to the point. Jesus Christ was a hellfire and brimstone preacher who preached more on hell than any other preacher in the Bible. Jesus Christ was a hellfire and brimstone preacher who preached more about hell than he did about heaven because he came to die, to suffer, to bleed, and to die on the cross, a cruel death, a humiliating death. He was naked before the world for you and for me. If you want to see how ugly and bad sin is, look at Jesus Christ's mangled body dripping with blood to the ground. That's how ugly and bad your sin is and mine. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, and this is a love that is beyond measure, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, gave up his son. To get a little taste of that, give up any one of your children for somebody else. 
and hang them on a cruel cross after watching them beaten beyond recognition. Father, mother, those of you who don't have children, you don't know what I'm talking about. You have no clue what I'm talking about. But those of us who have children, we would rather die than to see our baby daughter with leukemia at St. Jude's. And we're not sacrificing her at all. But it, it's a daily killing of us. It's a daily death to see one of our children now on that hospital bed with a bald head and body being, being eaten up with cancer. And we're not sacrificing our child for anybody. In fact, we wouldn't even do that. But God did it for you and me, his only child. Jesus Christ, that whosoever, that word whosoever means anybody at any time in history, believeth in him, that is, believe in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, should not perish, that is, in hell, but have everlasting life, that is, in heaven. It's as simple as that, folks. God made it easy for us to be saved. But it was very hard for him and very hard for Jesus. And so I would advise you to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today. I would humbly revise, advise you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again. I would strongly advise you to pray and ask God to save your soul through Jesus Christ today. And I'll be glad to lead you in that prayer, commonly called the sinner's prayer. Before I do, allow me to break it down even further. Romans 10, 9 and 13 says that if thou, you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou you shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you willing and ready to pray with me, believing in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away the sins of the world? Let's do it. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a wicked sinner and I have broken many of your Ten Commandments in my life. I have stolen other people's stuff before. I have coveted and lusted at the other people's family members and things. I have lied before. I have disobeyed my parents and dishonored my parents. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again. I receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I receive Jesus Christ into my heart. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul from hell. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past and to turn away from my old evil ways and to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ today, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, Allow me to say congratulations to you 
on doing the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do, after you enter through the door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Beloved, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, please email me at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com and let me know. We have some free material that we want to send you. If you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well, and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good, is my prayer. Let's all stand. Jesus will save you. Now